everybody. It's good to see you here this morning. Uh, I believe we got in here today without getting rained on. Uh, so that's a good thing, even though we appreciate the rain and have needed it greatly. It's been good to see the rain and the sunshine and the grass is greener and flowers are blooming and the trees are budding. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful time of the year. So would you stand with me this morning and let's pray. And I'll just acknowledge the presence of our Lord as we enter into our worship service. Heavenly Father, thank you for drawing us together, brothers and sisters in Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you would guide us through this time together in our meeting. And that you would do a work, a transformation in our hearts and minds. In our whole being, Lord, as we seek to follow you. And to be obedient to you and to grow in our love and understanding and our trust and our faith. Father, I pray that your words would permeate this room today, that you would uh, find our hearts and our ears attentive to your word. I pray that the songs we sing would bring a clear message, and I pray that our lives, when we leave this building, would reflect the presence of a living Savior in our hearts and in this world. And Father, you have your will and way today, Lord, in Jesus' name. All right, remain standing if you would, and let's sing this song, Open the Eyes of My Heart.
is power and the blood.
as they recover and face surgeries and, and uh, physical ailments. And the older we get, the more of those we have. Isn't that right? So let's get an amen there. But anyway, lift these folks up. And as a matter of information and prayer as well, uh, this week is our Southern Baptist Convention, which meets in Nashville this year. Uh, I'll be traveling tomorrow. I didn't think I was going to be able to go, but I am. So I'll be traveling tomorrow. Uh, the convention is Tuesday and Wednesday. And I, I need you to be in prayer. We need to be in prayer, period, about our convention. But there are a lot of things uh, at stake this year. And there's some, uh, some things that could change our denomination, uh, things that could desperately change, drastically change um, how the Southern Baptists move forward from here. Uh, first thing was going to be our name, which is changing to uh, the uh, Great Commission uh, Baptist. Um, that's the least of the things that are changing. Other things are pretty concerning. Um, so pray for the convention this year. This is not the first time that the convention has um, had some troubles. Um, several years ago, there was a pastor who the Lord orchestrated as being the uh, speaker, and he delivered a message from God's holy word that changed the whole convention and brought it back to the conservative roots that it was founded on and has operated under for many, many years. But this year, things could change. And so pray that God will intervene. Things have already changed in a lot of ways. So uh, I would ask you to be in prayer, especially Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, about our convention. And the reason I thought about that is on our prayer concern, we have missionaries listed. <coughs> and our, our missionaries, particularly the IMB missionaries, international mission board missionaries, are 100% funded by the cooperative program. And if our individual congregations go their separate ways, those missionaries come off the field. It's happened before. So pray. There's more at stake here than just um, aligning with a certain denomination or this side of the aisle or that side of the aisle. There are souls affected by what goes on this kind of week. Many souls. So please be in prayer about that. I appreciate that very much. I get to spend a little time with the kids. Kids, can y'all come on down here and just sit on the steps if you don't mind, please? Any others? Have a seat there, that's good. If you had donuts, you'd get a bigger crowd. That's right. <laughs> I would if there'd be adults down here, too. Hey, how you doing? Good. Hey, y'all doing good? Yeah. You up for the challenge of whatever's coming next? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I need you to do something very simple for us, okay? It's a demonstration, and I need one of you to volunteer. <laughs> the man, good for you. All right. All right. Good job. Can you go stand over there at that door? And, and I'll give you instructions, but all you have to do is get from that door to that door. Can you handle that? Just go, uh, well, not yet. No, there's instructions to follow. But you have to get from that. Can you do that on your own? Just walk from there to there? Yeah. Okay. Here's the instructions. I want you to turn around and face that door. Close your eyes and keep them closed. Now you're going to have to go from there to that door over there. No, no, no. You gotta keep turning around. You gotta stay that way. Okay? Do you think you might need help now? You would. Okay? Well, we just happen to have a volunteer here to help you. Okay? Okay? Can you, you, you think, can you help me? Can you help me? Okay. Turn back around. Close your eyes. Nestor, can you go? He's going to need to hear you closely and carefully, so you don't have to stay there. You can go close to him. He might need you to guide him, okay? Can you do that? Now, be nice to him now, okay? Okay, Angel. You can go ahead, Nestor. Now, keep your eyes closed, and you got to walk backwards, Nestor. You might want to get close to him so you don't, he don't hurt himself. And 
Talk to him so he can understand what's next. You're, you're, I know, Nestor, you can, you can look. You got to get him from here to there, but he can't look. You can. He can't. Okay? He said, you just talk and I'll follow your voice. All right? Close your eyes and turn around, Nestor. You can, you can just direct him. Okay. Come on. Back up, Angel. Nestor, you can follow him. You just give him directions. Does he need to go faster or slower? Slow down. Stop, 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 stop. <laughs> Give him directions now. Okay. <laughs> you <Yeah. laughs> Y'all are doing great. Doing great. <laughs> Come on over here. <laughs> what is it about cheating with your eyes closed? Come on over here. All right. What'd you learn? What'd you learn, Angel? It's okay to have help. It's okay to have help. Y'all are so smart. It is okay to have help. And Esther, what'd you learn? Yes. We could leave right now and you can have our text nailed. That's what we're talking about today. Encouraging each other daily. Now, Angel, when I first said you got to get from there to there, did that seem like a difficult task? No. no. What changed? Okay, when I said turn around and close your eyes, then things changed, didn't they? You see, God tells us to follow Him. He says, come follow me. But we don't have the details, right? And a lot of times, it's like we're walking backwards with our eyes shut. But who is there to encourage us? God. And who else is there to encourage us? Yes, the church. And today we're talking about a text in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 through 19. And we're told by the writer of Hebrews, as God inspired the writer, to say, encourage each other daily, okay, in our walk, in our daily walk. Y'all did so good. Thank you, fellas. Can y'all give them a hand? Oh, I, I don't know. I'll, be, I'll ask him questions next time. Okay. Thank you, fellas. Thank you. Okay, y'all can leave. <laughs> um, so smart. And uh, in case you haven't uh, figured it out, a lot of times you can, um, you'll remember that more than you'll remember a lot of things that I say up here. And that's this sermon, just in a, a form that sometimes our minds can wrap around a little bit better. Did you see the expression on his face when I said you had to turn around and close your eyes? <laughs> Things change. And you know, if you know the Lord at all, you know that God uh, very seldom gives us the whole picture at the beginning. Usually he says, come follow me. And then as we begin to walk, he gives us the details. Okay? But that trust and faith has to be initiated by God's calling and us responding. Come follow. One thing that, and, and I couldn't have orchestrated that better, that Nestor did. I couldn't hear what he was saying to Angel. But Angel could. Because he walked with him. He got close to him and he walked with him. Another thing that he did, you notice the angel was getting closer and closer to the table here, which was a little nerve-wracking. But what, but what Nestor was doing to begin with, he was saying, go to your right, go to your right. He was going to his right. But Nestor was facing this way and this was his right. Angel was facing that way and that was his left. What did Nestor do? He thought about what Angel was perceiving, what Angel understood, and he changed his directions. He learned his language. He learned what he was hearing, and he changed his direction to fit what Angel would understand. Okay. The Bible tells us to encourage one another daily. Daily. It's an ongoing phrase, an ongoing command. All right. Go to Hebrews.
Hebrews chapter 3, if you would. Hebrews chapter 3. And we're going to start with verse 12, but as a reminder, um, last week we finished the quote from Psalm 95 as the writer was telling us about what happened in former times when the Israelites rebelled against the Lord in the wilderness, remember? And they wouldn't listen to him, and they wanted it their way, and they were very rebellious, and, and they fell away, and God was angry with them and said, I'm not putting up with this. And, and they wandered around until they all died that were 20 and over. God said, you won't enter my rest. And even in this passage today, the writer goes back and quotes one of those verses one more time in case the, his uh, audience missed it. But I want you to look at, at verse 12. And there's a, this is part of the second warning that we get to in the book of Hebrews. Um, the second warning is pretty extensive. You have a warning and then you have hope. Um, after every warning, uh, there is judgment. And you see that very clearly. But I want you to understand today there is hope in what he's saying here. Okay, so listen carefully. In verse 12, Hebrews 3, verse 12. Take care, brethren. Now, who's he talking to when he says brethren? He's talking to believers. Okay? There is no, um, and so far, we're in chapter 3, and so far we have no hint that the writer's writing to anybody except believers. We've had that over and over again where he says brethren. Um, he talks about partaking together. He says we a lot. The same thing here. Take care, brethren lest there should be any uh, one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. Verse 13, But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 14, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm, until the end. While it is said, and this is the quote that he's already said uh, up in the, the verses that we did uh, talked about last week. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. As he's quoting the Holy Spirit back in Psalm 95. It says, verse 16, for who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they should not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? And so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Unbelief. Okay. Entering God's rest is, uh, is a reality, but a lot of times here in the passage in Hebrews is used as a metaphor for what? When we think of God's rest, ultimately, we think of what? Heaven. 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 Okay? Yes. There is another aspect of this that we've already talked about, and that's our daily resting in Him and, and not to continue to strive in our own works and our own self-righteousness, but in His work of Calvary. What does that mean? Um, this week, I was... Um, Standing out in the yard near the road, watching the lightning storm in the, in the distance, wondering if it was coming our way or not. It was just beautiful to watch. And there was a, a fellow coming down the road in a scaled-down golf cart with, with no fiberglass body to it, just a frame. He was sitting on a cushion on top of batteries, and he had this thing juiced up. He had a York motor in it from a forklift, and the thing would fly. I mean, fly. And he pulls over, comes right up to me. I don't know who all's watching, so I have to be careful. There was a strong odor of an organic material that you can light. Okay? And, and we started talking, and the Lord started working, and he said, can't you forgive and forget? He wasn't talking to me. He was talking about a conversation he just had. He said, well, physically it's impossible for us to forget something willfully. But we're supposed to forgive and let it go by. But you can't consciously say, I'll never remember that again. And that be it. We don't have that power. God does. But we don't. So we started talking about forgiveness and 
and letting things pass by. Even though some people may be a little inebriated or a little, sometimes God works and they remember things later. They may not know what to do with it at the moment, but they can remember it later. Okay? We had, we had a good conversation. One of those divine appointments uh, that nobody orchestrated. It just, just kind of happened. Sometimes you and I get so complacent, we think, God's only here in this building on Sundays and maybe on Wednesdays, once or twice a year. That's it. And this is the Christian life. As long as I do these things and go here, stay here for a while, and I'm good to go. That's not the Christian life at all. The Christian life is ongoing. It's walking every day, everywhere we are. And sometimes we just get complacent, you know. And we're not looking for the extraordinary or looking for the divine appointments or we're just... We get tired. You know, isn't it easy just to get tired and to fall in a rut? You ever fell in a rut? Okay. Falling in a rut is an easy thing to do. Getting out is a problem. Okay. Well, I want you to understand something about the Israelites and the writer, what he's talking about here in Hebrews. The people were enslaved for 400 years. And they got used to it. They got used to it. How do we know this? Because God delivered them from their captors and they were in the wilderness complaining. Can we not just go back? Because we had food and shelter there. Now you, you let us out in the wilderness and we're going to starve and, and, and our children's going to perish and our animals are dying. And just put us back in the, in the chains. And folks, it's so easy to look at, that, at those folks and to say, how in the world could they be so ungrateful? But we, we really need to cross the bridge of their day and time to our day and time and in our own lives, in our own hearts, in our own homes and say, how can I become so complacent, God? How can I get to the point of saying, you know, it's really not worth it. Well, look at the passage here in, in verse 12. It says, take care, brethren, lest there should be any one of you, an, un, an evil, unbelieving heart, and falling away from the living God. I want you to know a couple things about this verse. First of all, falling away, that phrase indicates movement away from a point of reference. This is the Greek, Greek definition. A movement away from a point of, of, of reference, a fixed point of reference. In this case, the living God. There's an insinuation, a very clear indication in verse 12 that he's saying, be careful not to let a heart, an evil heart form in you and cause you to fall away. You're not there yet, but it could cause you to be there. It could cause you to move away from the stability of Christ and being Christ-centered. And he says, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. I was going to read to you the definition of all that, but... It's a little lengthy and boring sometimes. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of words there, and they give indication that the writer's not talking about people who are already evil in their hearts and have already fallen from God. But people, as he's already indicated, brethren, sisters, people in the church, and he says, be careful not to allow this to happen to you. That's the warning, but he's going to apply this warning and see, how, how can we prevent this from happening? Okay? Look at verse 13, if you would. Verse 13 says, but, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And the word hardened there is an ongoing thing. It's, it's this could happen. This will happen. But the first part of verse 13 is, but encourage one another day after day. This is another reason we are not islands in the stream. Okay? Every time I say that, I think of my professor. I wrote about that. That's the only student seminary ever to write a paper on a Kenny Rogers song. <laughs> islands in the stream. And this is why. We are not created to be islands in the stream. We are created to be community, a, a community. Work together. 
to pull together. That's why the, when the scripture says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as some have, have become, a, it's become a habit for them. It wasn't just so I can come and get encouraged, or I could come and sing songs, or I could come and see people I don't see but once a week. But he knew the dynamic of us being together, of us working together, encouraging each other, admonishing one another, loving each other, praying for one another. There's a dynamic that God put within us that we need that we have to have to survive, and that's community. And the writer of Hebrews says, listen, if you don't want to fall away, if you don't want to have this hardening of your heart, if you don't want to fall in this category of those who were in the wilderness and rebelled and the Lord let them die there, if you don't want to be in that category, then start encouraging one another daily, every day. Encourage each other. Find ways to encourage. And the word doesn't just stop at an encouraging, pleasant word. The, the word goes on to admonition. And admonition is a strong, urgent encouragement. Uh, and, and, and it's just like a, a picture of someone in the traffic, someone standing out on the road, and you see tricky cars coming, and you're saying, you might want to move. Would you do that? You, you might want to move. Or would you say, get out of the road, there's cars coming. There's an urgency here. You want them to hear you, and you want them to get out of the road. Well, what if they don't like what you say? Are you worried about that at the moment? Mm -mm. You cared about them getting out of the road. We'll deal with whether you like how I said it or not later. But I want you to get out of the road because you're in imminent danger. That's, that's what's happening here. He says, encourage one another with this urgency, this urgency. This love and compassion for one another to say, if you remain as you are, unless you move forward with God, if, if you don't keep going with Him, you fall into this category of there's a possibility of your heart hardening and, and you falling away and walking away from Him. You know that's our tendency, right? I use that illustration of the escalator all the time. I think of it in my simple mind can understand that. You know, you want an escalator. And when we were kids, I told you this before, I guess we were the only ones that did this. If you were on an escalator going down and you were trying to go up, did you ever do that? So I'm the only one guilty of that. See, escalator's going down. There's another one that goes up, but that's too easy. So you go around to the one that's coming down and see if you can get up there fast enough. You know? But if you stop moving, what happens? Do you stand still? The escalator is going to take you back down to where you came from. That's life. And that's our nature. And if we're not walking with Him and continually growing close to Him, our tendency, our nature within us is going to pull us back from Him immediately. We have to continue to work to get closer, to walk with Him, to grow in Him. If y'all want to be entertained sometime, go down to the boat ramp, Merle's Inlet or up at North Myrtle Beach and sit there and watch people try to put their boats on the trailer or take them off. <laughs> that might not be the nicest thing to do, but it's funny. Um, <laughs> especially people who have never been on the water before and the first boat they own is like a yacht. And they get out there and the current's pulling and the wind's blowing and they're wondering why they can't drive this thing like a boat. I saw the funniest video of a guy that his trailer broke loose. That was uh, There was a jet ski on it and somehow he had climbed up on top of the jet ski and was turning with all his might. And the trailer was still going off the ditch. And he thought if he just turned the jet ski that the trailer would <laughs> doesn't work that way. <laughs> but the thing about watching people at the boat ramp is that the current and the wind will win out all the time unless you know what you're doing. Okay? And I see a lot of people, they'll scramble. They'll get close to the dock and they'll shut the motor off and they'll take off running up to the bow and by the time they get there, the boat's already drifted a couple of feet away from the dock. Okay? In our lives, there's a constant pressure to drift. It's our nature. It's built in. You're not going to remain stagnant. You're going to go backwards. Unless we are purposefully, intentionally walking toward the Lord, with the Lord, <laughs> Every single day. There is no such thing as a believer remaining stagnant. Doesn't happen. I used to think that was what happened. 
Mm -hmm. I, I probably have said it before. Um, feel like we're on a plateau, and we went to Nairobi, and they told us dress, you know, bring some jackets, and it's going to be in the seventies all the time. We in Kenya. He said, "Yes, but you're a mile high, but it's flat. It's a plateau." Well, that's kind of like our lives. No, it's not. You and I won't plateau until we get to heaven. And that's going to be the ultimate. We are either moving forward or moving backwards. Okay? Look at the, what the scripture says. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I want to read this to you. It's from, from a commentary, New American Commentary. Um, it says both here and throughout the epistle, and there's a citing of chapter 4 and chapter 10 and 12 and 13, the author challenged the community of readers to devote themselves to watching out for each other. Collective responsibility was the order of the day for the author. The warnings were addressed to the entire community, but there is a double reference in verse 12 and 13 to individual members. One of the writers says this illustrates the author's conviction expressly stated in 12.15 that it only takes one unbelieving member to corrupt the entire community. If the individual was left alone, the author would have agreed um, with another writer, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. It's in the song that we sing. We're prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love. A little reading down a little further says the clause, as long as it is called today means that encouragement is to continue as long as today lasts. The context does not specify this length of time, but it is to be understood as more than a single day from the context, and especially from Hebrews 4, 7, which we'll get to uh, maybe next week, Lord willing. It could refer to the second coming of Christ. It could be taken in a more generic sense as referring to the time while there is still opportunity to hear God speaking. Whatever the exact meaning, a sense of urgency is indicated since it is obvious that today will not last indefinitely. Okay? Today, there's a sense of urgency to encourage one another. Okay? You don't want to see each other fall or fail. We're, we're a group. We're a family. We work together. We encourage each other, lift each other up, admonish each other. There's a time when, when sometimes, you, it's, sometimes we do this with children or Maybe we were the recipient of that when we were little. Your parents or your guardians ever grabbed you by the shoulders and say, now look at me, like you couldn't see them. Okay, now look at me. What does that mean? How does that translate? It means listen to what I'm about to say. I want your undivided attention. And sometimes we have to do that and say, look at me. I want to tell you something that's causing pr trouble, trouble in your life and, and causing problems with your walk with Christ. And as a friend, as a brother, as a sister, I'm urgently asking you to consider this in your life so that you don't just drift away and not know it. And folks, that's, that's probably the greatest, one of the greatest fears. Satan has a, he has a lot of weapons in his armory, but he is seldom just blunt. He's a great deceiver and a master of just convincing us to just move away just a little bit. And then, before we know it, we've moved away just a little bit further. And it's not painful. It's not really bad. Nothing major's happened. And we get used to it. And then, we're a little further and a little further. That's how Satan works. And the writer of Hebrews is warning his readers with all that he has and says, please, please, please encourage each other. Look out for each other as long as the day is, as long as you have on planet Earth. Look out for one another because our nature and our bent is to, to, to walk away, to abandon, to go our own route and not to stick with God. That's not within us except when the Holy Spirit indwells us. I'll show you this a little further down here, okay? And in uh, verse 14, um, verse 14, it says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm. 
until the end. Now, the and we could this is we could spend a whole month on this one verse, but to become uh, is to come into existence, to begin to be. And it says in verse 14, for we have become, we have begun to be partakers of Christ if. Please don't miss that word. If. There's a condition here. If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. If you had to sum up Hebrews and the, and the five warning passages, this is a good verse to do that. It's conditional. We have become partakers with Christ. We have begun our walk with Him, our journey with Him. We have come into existence as a partaker, a joint heir of the kingdom, um, His child. We have, have begun to walk with Him and begun that relationship. If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end, well, how are you going to know? How are you going to know? We better be walking with Him, folks. Nowhere in Scripture have I ever found a detached uh, gospel which says, I prayed there, I'm going to heaven there, anywhere in between is mine. Nowhere in Scripture. Everywhere I read, whether it's the Old Testament, the New Testament, whether it's Jesus, Peter, Paul, James, whomever speaking, it is always a continuing process, an ongoing journey. If you're thinking, I, I met him back there, and I'll see him again over there, and anything in between, I, it's up to me. You are lost as you can be. And I can give you scripture to back that up. It is about an ongoing walk and journey, folks. Ongoing. Angel and Nestor, our two junior pastors today, are a family. They're cousins. Okay. They know how each other think. They get along like brothers, and they fight like brothers, even though they're cousins. But they know each other. They spend a lot of time together. Sometimes they probably know what each other's thinking before the other one says it. And when there's candy or food involved, they know what the other one's going to go for. Because they hang out. We have to spend time with the Lord so that we know His character. We know which direction He's going to go. If we're in a conversation, we don't have to ask. We know this is the direction Jesus is going in this conversation. I know Him. I walk with Him. It's an ongoing journey. If we want the, the eternity, if we want the eternal life in heaven, then let's walk with Him every day. Every day. I share with you about a song that I heard years ago, and it still reminds me, kind of keeps me, or brings me back on track. If, if heaven wasn't what heaven is described as being in, in the Bible, which it is, but it, if just say it wasn't for just a second, and there was no street of gold, no, no gate, pearl, no loved ones who had gone on before us, the song says, I'd still want to go. Because Jesus would be there. If there were no crystal river, no mansion, I'd still want to go. Because that's where my Lord is. And folks, the only way that you and I can ever get to that point is to walk with Him and get to know Him and fall in love with Him and grow in Him. And if we're together with Him, we know the Holy Spirit gives us evidence. First John records it very clearly for us. This, the Holy Spirit tells us, gives us assurance of knowing where He is as we walk with Him. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. In verse 15, he's, this is where he quotes uh, Psalm 95 again. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked Him. Okay. And look at verse 16. For who provoked Him? When they had heard, indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Who are these people? Mainly, they're Jewish people. They're the Hebrews. Not always. Not all of them. A lot of them are Egyptians that came with them. Matter of fact, a lot of them 
are half Egyptian, half Hebrew. And we have evidence of that as well. It goes back to when Joseph came, his wife, and his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. They're half Hebrew, half Egyptian. And there's a lot of folks that, that come out of there that, that aren't Hebrews, but what we learn here, it says, for who provoked him when they had heard? The Hebrews knew the past. They knew what God had done in the past. They knew about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They still turned away from him. How can you do that? Because it's been 400 years. That's how. Is God obligated to answer our prayers immediately? No. Is he obligated to answer our prayers in the timing that we would like for him to? No. God's not obligated to do anything. But he loves you. And he loves me more than anybody on the planet ever has come close to. So the answers to his prayers are going to come when it honors him and when it's best for me and for you. But a lot of folks have forgotten that and they were disobedient to him. They provoked him. In verse 16 it says, Did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses, they're the ones that provoked him. Verse 17 says, And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? The majority of these folks are his chosen people. He called them out. He raised them up. He gave them a future and a hope. And he told them that I will multiply them. The word here in verse 17 where it says sin, what well, was it not those who sinned? It means to miss the mark. And I heard a pastor not long ago said, it's not what it means. It is what it means. It's what the Greek word says here. Sin means missing the mark. Wander from the path of uprightness and honor to do or go wrong. Missing the mark. That is Satan's forte to get us to miss the mark. Well, I hit the target, but did you hit the bullseye? Well, I got close. Satan wants you to get close. He doesn't want you to hit the target. He wants you to miss it just a little bit. That's what he's good at. And folks, if we're not careful, we'll be okay with that. Okay? So he says that they sinned whose bodies fell in the wilderness. Verse 18, And to whom did he swear that they should not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? Again, the word disobedient is to not to allow oneself to be persuaded, to refuse or withhold belief. In other words, I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what you say. I'm not going to believe it. Now, who would do that in their right mind? A lot of folks do. A lot of folks say, I, I believe God's word up to a point. And where it causes me problems and causes me to have to change and it causes my life to be turned upside down, I don't want any of that. That's what this word means. It means to withhold belief, to hold back from believing, to refuse to believe. It's not about truth anymore. It's about will. It's about, I hear what you say. I don't even believe it's the truth. But I'm not going to yield to it. That's will. And he says that the children in the desert did that. The children of Israel. They shall not enter my rest, but to those who were disobedient. And so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. And this last word, unbelief, simply means unfaithfulness. They weren't faithful to their Lord. They were unfaithful. They refused to believe. Folks, this passage gives us a warning and it gives us hope. He says, don't let this happen to you. It happened to the children of Israel. All of them, 20 years of age and older, died in the wilderness as they wandered for 40 years. Why? Because they were disobedient. And the last word there was because of unbelief. They were unfaithful to their Lord. They refused to to submit to his word, his authority. The good news that we'll end on today is we are commissioned, commanded, and allowed the privilege of encouraging one another as long as it is today. My eldest daughter might be listening. She might not. But anyway, I sent her a text the other day. So we'll find out she's listening. She said, I'll call you, Daddy, today. 
So I started counting down. <laughs> so after midnight, I sent her a text. It is no longer today, it is tomorrow. However, technically, tomorrow is today. Today. <laughs> but if you wait too long, it's going to be tomorrow again. Today has become yesterday. But you're still good for right now because it's still today. <laughs> Took her a while to respond to that. She said, what are you talking about? <laughs> we only have today. Yesterday's gone. Tomorrow hasn't come yet. We only have today. And the writer of Hebrew says, you encourage each other while it's still today. It has several meanings, obviously. That means now. It means now. And tomorrow, it's going to be now. Until we see him face to face. Encourage each other. Admonish one another. Have a heart and compassion for each other. We are not islands in the stream. If you and I are trying to live that way, we are living a life of disobedience and rebellion. We were called, commanded, built, created to be community. A community that's founded in God's holy word that operates in the presence of his spirit and journeys with him every day. All right. So let's encourage each other in God's holy word. Encourage each other not to give up, not fall away, not to become hardened in our hearts with the deceitfulness of sin, as the writer says. But to stick close with God, to stick close with God, and to continue to walk with Him every day. A pastor friend of mine that uh, in North Carolina had this saying this, that he got from Scripture, but it was his mantra, moment by moment, moment by moment, trust Him, follow Him, moment by moment. Okay. We're going to sing a song together. And then um, we will dismiss. Think about the words of the song as we sing together. Would you stand, please? <laughs> the song is not a typical invitation. It's Days of Elijah, which says it's a commission song. It says we need to go out and tell people about who he is. <laughs> Encourage one another and also go out into a lost world. Tell them about the Lord.
let's go let the world know that there is an answer to all these problems. His name is Jesus. All right. Thank you so much for being here today. Let's take God's word with us as we leave this building. Encourage one another in the faith and uh, continue to walk closely with God each day. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, thank you for your kindness and your goodness and grace. I thank you for admonition. It's not a word that we use a lot or like, but I thank you, Lord, that if we love one another enough, we'll address issues. And I thank you that you've called us to, to come together, to work in community, to have compassion enough for people to, to spend time with them, to talk with them, to help them to grow in their walk with Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you would grow us in our walk with you as we spend time with you. Lord, I ask you to, to pour out your blessings, your presence on these folks and their homes and their family, Lord. And I pray that the hedge of, protect, of protection would be about us, not so that we could be safe from things that, that affect our brothers and sisters necessarily, but we could be safe from things that have eternal effect. I pray, Father, that you would grow our children up to know you and to love you, protect them, Father. They live in, a, in quite a different world, a very hostile world than a lot of us grew up in. I pray that you would uh, make us strong in our faith. Give us uh, the courage to be examples to our children and those watching uh, to live and, and to trust in you, Lord. And Lord, at this time, I ask you according to your word. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.